Thank you very much. It's so great to be here to share this book with you. This is, has been my passion for the last number of years, and uh, it's a lot of fun for me to share it. And uh, I have to be careful that I don't break into a terrible English accent, because I'm sure you guys don't know this, but I love different accents, but I'm terrible at them. And for like six month period, I was doing all my surgeries with an English accent. And uh, I sounded a lot smarter, I have to say. You guys probably all do. Maybe you don't feel that way uh, since you're used to it. But all the nurses love scrubbing with me because they all wanted to try and say things. So I would keep saying, can you please pass the diathermy, love? And uh, <laughs> it was really a lot of fun. Apart, I also always wanted to be a comedian, so I may um, break into a, a number of different jokes. Hopefully they won't be inappropriate. But let me start by talking a little bit about kind of why and how I wrote this book. Because maybe, maybe a lot of people have asked me, you know, you're a transplant surgeon, you run a lab, why, why would you write a book at this point in your career and where did you find the time? I don't know the answer to the time piece, but I grew up really in a family of books. We were uh, big readers in my family. My parents made us read two books a week when I was growing up, particularly in the summer, but even during the year, at least one book a week. And they would read them all as well, and we would talk about them at the dinner table. And I suppose that could make you go either way. You could end up hating reading, but I ended up really loving it. My brother is a writer, Ben Mesrich, and probably a, n a number of you have seen some of his books. He wrote uh, the book behind The Social Network and the book behind the movie 21 about the MIT gamblers and has a book launching, I think, tomorrow on Bitcoin. So I, I imagine a lot of people at Google are interested in Bitcoin. So maybe you'll check that out. But I've watched his career and I've always been fascinated by it, learned about the world of writing and, and always knew I had a book in me or maybe more than one book. We'll see what my editors think about that. In 2011, I read the book Emperor of All Maladies, and maybe some of you have read that. That's a book about the history of cancer, or particularly blood cancers in children. And it was written by a guy, Mukherjee, who wrote this beautiful book where he used his patients to tell the story of the history of these cancers. And he ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize, and is a very special book. But when I was reading it, I was thinking, I want to do something like this for transplant. I had some different ideas, though. Number one, I did want to tell my own coming of age as a surgeon and what it's like to be a surgeon. I've always been fascinated to read about people in various fields and what it's like to do what they do and really learn about that. And I wanted to write a really honest book that really said, like, all right, you want to know what this is really like, what it's like to screw up and have a patient die, what it's like to have to make these decisions without enough information that are going to alter the course of someone, you know, what it's like to deal with complications day in and day out where, where you know you played some role in, role in causing them and making the patient miserable, but also the incredible victories, the, the incredible feeling when you plan things out and they go well. I wanted to really share that piece. So that was one part of the book. I also really wanted to tell the history of transplant, much like Mukherjee did in Emperor of All Maladies. One of the really special things about transplant, it's an incredibly new field. In the 1940s into 50s, it was total science fiction. In the 50s and 60s, it was kind of this crazy field that a few crazy people were involved with, but no one really gave it a chance of, of working out. And it wasn't really until 1983 with the approval of cyclosporin, the medication that suppresses the immune system, that transplant became a reliable, legitimate field. And actually, uh, it was a Brit who gets credit for that, Sir, Sir Roy Colner. I guess if you're a Sir, you don't say their last name, I'm told, so Sir Roy, who's still alive. I think he's 88 and lives in Cambridge and, hel and helped me with some of the history of the book. But it's a really, really new field, and a lot of those pioneers were still alive. And I wanted to travel around and talk to those that I could find and really understand what that experience was like. But I, I didn't just want to find out what they did because I knew what they did. I mean, that's been written before. I really wanted to understand how they were able to do what they did. How were they able to persist when everyone thought they were crazy, they were murderers, 
They were, people were signing petitions saying, get these guys out of here. They weren't referring them patients. And, and I know you can say, oh, the patients would have died anyways. They had kidney failure, they had liver failure, they had heart failure, so, so who cares, they would have died anyways. But I, I don't buy that. As a surgeon who takes care of patients and patients who are very, very sick, when, you, when they die in front of you in your hands, it doesn't matter that they were really sick. It still is this incredible burden. And they persisted for years living with that. And so I wanted to understand how did they cope? What did, what did they do? But maybe most important, I wanted to tell the story of the patients. And one of the things I like to say about transplant, it's different than other areas of healthcare. In other areas of medicine, we're trying to prevent death fight off death, or maybe give someone a good death, which is certainly a, a, an important goal. But transplant is different. Transplant, in many cases, we take from death. It starts with death. It starts with a donor. And I've always felt like the donors were my patients, too. And I think having this connection is incredibly special. And it's, a, it's, it's something that's special about transplant that I really value. Of course, we also have living donors who are, in my opinion, like the ultimate heroes, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in the future, um, later on in this talk, I should say. And, it, and it's really a story about innovation. So anyways, I had all these thoughts, and I knew I wanted to write this book, and I was like, how do I do this? Well, one piece of advice, if any of you guys are thinking of writing a book, I totally recommend you get a sibling who's a best-selling writer. That's like <laughs> the best thing you could do, I think. Um, it, maybe not a sibling, a parent, a, maybe a really close friend would help as well. But Ben helped me tremendously with advice, and, I, and mostly advice. I don't think he's even read the book, but that's another story. But um, he also helped me get an agent, and that was key. I learned a lot writing this book, but one thing I learned is that fiction and nonfiction are like two totally different entities. My sense is they're as different as being a surgeon and working at Google. Like, they're totally different fields. And I was in the nonfiction arena. And in nonfiction, you actually typically sell your book before you've written the whole thing, because the editor will play a big role in writing it. So Ben helped me get an agent, and the agent said, all right, let's, we need to write a proposal. And I said, OK, I got a proposal, and I sent it to him. And the proposal was about 15 pages long, and it was titled The Legend of Big Daddy, because I made my fellows call me Big Daddy, which is a whole other story that I can't get into. <laughs> I could get into it in, in a different form. But he, Eric got this, and he was like, no, no, we're not doing this. So we spent about a year going back and forth working on this proposal. And he would kind of assign me, like, all right, this, this section, let's work on this chapter. In this chapter, I want you to write about who the characters are, kind of what, what's going to happen to those characters. Or in another chapter, he might say, now why don't you give a flavor of your actual writing, maybe even write a section of it. So we kind of went through this for a year back and forth. And at the end of that year, I had about a 50 to 60 page outline that was a pretty complete outline where someone could read that and know what the book was going to be about and actually have some sense that I could actually write it. It's a lot like writing a grant. You have to prove to them you can actually come up with something at the end. So once I finished that, he sent it off to editors. And I ended up interviewing with editors. I went with Gail Winston who is really wonderful and uh, very experienced, has been in the writing world forever. So then I, once the book was sold, I, I said, all right, Gail, what do I do? And she's like, well, why don't you write the book? <laughs> and I was like, should I write a chapter? Should I write the whole thing? And she was like, well, normally people write the whole thing, but you can do whatever you want. So I wrote a couple of chapters and sent them to her. And about two weeks later, I get this note from Gail that was like, Josh, Trust me on this, just cut the entire first chapter, and why don't you just go ahead and write the whole book? <laughs> and the reason she cut the first chapter, it was a pure comedy chapter, and it was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, it was probably along the lines of Adam Kay's book, uh, This Is Going to Hurt. Even funnier than that, if I can say, although he's had a good career now as a comedian, I think, but, um, but I had to cut that. So I am working on a comedy show called The Cutting Room Floor, uh, which I hope to be able to perform at some other venue, preferably when you're all drinking alcohol, because I think it'll <laughs> be funnier then. But so then I was like, all right, I'm going to write this book. And my brother gave me two pieces of advice that I think, if any of you guys think about writing, I think they, they could help you. Number one, he said, when you start writing a book, just write. Don't try and make it perfect. Don't worry if you digress. It doesn't really matter. Just write. Because he said the number one reason 
people don't finish a book is they try and make it perfect, they can't get past the first chapter, and they never write the book. And so he's like, just write, don't even worry. And the second thing he said was, at the end of like the day when you're, when you're done writing for that day, never end at the end of a chapter or at the end of a story. Because he said the hardest thing is when you get up in the morning, you're messing with the internet, which I'm sure you guys do a lot. You know, you're, you're online, your TV, your kids are around, and you, you can't get started, you can't get going. But if you stopped right in the middle of a story or even in the middle of a sentence, you'll start writing to finish that. And before you know it, you've got the flow going and you just start writing. Maybe that wouldn't work for everyone, but that worked incredibly well for me. So I just wrote like a maniac for a year. And I, I actually had no problem writing. I wrote like crazy. And I knew I was digressing. I knew I was writing about things that wouldn't be in the final book. But I really enjoyed it. I learned so much. It was incredibly fun. I would sit there in the corner cackling. And my wife was like, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, I'm just, this is so great. And <laughs> I always had confidence in it for whatever reason. I just knew the story was so great. So I got to the end of a year, and I was like, wow, I've written a lot. And I said to Ben, how long is a book? And Ben said, well, we usually do books in words, and an average book is 60 to 120,000 words or so. How long is yours? And I was like, I can't tell you how long it is. And he's like, no, no, just tell me. Now keep in mind, I was a Russian language and literature major, so I was used to reading Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and those guys could write, really write. So I, my book was 300,000 words, <laughs> which is longer than the Bible, actually. <laughs> it probably won't have that type of staying power, but you never know. So I was like, wow, this is really long. And I didn't know what to do. I, uh, I knew I had a lot to cut, but I wanted Gail to look at it. I thought, I just, what if she's like, this is totally the wrong direction, I don't want this. So I said, Gail, can I share this with you? Probably a mistake. There was a, a, a famous writer, Thomas Ricks, who wrote a, a, a piece on writing a book, and he wrote, the first draft is for the writer, the second draft is for the editor, and the third draft is for the public. And I sent Gail my first draft, and I'm sure she was horrified. I, I had to send it in a special way because it was so much memory. It was so long, I couldn't even email it. But I didn't hear from her for like two months, and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's just going to cancel this whole thing. And then she came back to me and was like, listen, I edited 100,000 words, and why don't you apply that to the rest of it? So then I spent another year working on the editing, shortening the book, you know, honing it down. But I, had, I loved every second of it. It was this incredible journey. I felt so supported. The only thing that didn't support me was my spine, L1 through 5. I definitely, writing a book is worse for your back than, I think, doing surgery, which surprised me. But, uh, other than that, it was this incredible journey, and I, I loved every second of it. And uh, if any of you guys have that in you, I highly, highly recommend it. It is really a, a wonderful experience. There's a funny, this may be a little bit inappropriate, but it's funny. After I wrote the book, um, you start getting feedback, and most of my feedback has been great. I, gotten some awesome reviews, a starred review in Kierkegaard, I was really happy with that. But the feedback that probably matters is like your family, right? So my parents thought it was amazing, but they would always say that about me. And Ben, of course, didn't read it, which is normal, but he said it was great. Um, I was really nervous to give it to my wife because she's, a, she's um, this very high quality person, but is super honest and able to criticize with the best of them, and she loved it. But it was really funny. I then for reasons that are not clear, gave it to her mom, my mother-in-law, and she read the book, and she's the master critic. <laughs> like, she, she really is. She's a super smart person, but she's like, Josh, I read your book, and, and she didn't say if it was good or bad. She was like, I just was really surprised, because I thought there were really a lot of bad words in there. Like, you don't talk like that. And I said, what are you talking about, bitch? <laughs> No, I said, did it ever occur to you that like, you're my mother-in-law? Like, I <laughs> we have to edit that out of this. <laughs> it was really funny. But um, you know, it takes a lot of sort of confidence and inner strength to put yourself out there. And uh, to me, it's all fun. I, I love hearing criticism. I've always taken criticism well. But um, I love telling that joke, because she gets really embarrassed when I tell it. All right, now let me talk a little bit about the book itself. I actually start and end the book on an airplane. And I did that on purpose because 
I think there's this incredible excitement or adventurous spirit to transplant. It's really this innovative field. It's this kind of field on the edge of life and death. We push the limits. And I think we're not quite like mountain climbers or, or uh, like free soloing El Cap or something like that. But I've always felt like the flying out to these other hospitals is this really exciting part of the job. And my friends were all really surprised that we did that. So I start the book. I'll read just a little bit if that's OK, because the words are so good. But um, I start the book with a chapter called A Perfect Organ in a small plane over the hills of La Crosse, Wisconsin, September 2 AM. While I'd been on planes many times, I'd never experienced the full power of a thunderstorm at 10,000 feet. The small King Air, a six-passenger dual prop, was bouncing around uncontrollably. Every few seconds, it would go into free fall and then hurl itself back up violently. The two pilots in the cockpit were hitting knobs and dials, trying to silence the various alarms that sounded as we rocked violently back and forth. It didn't help that our physician's assistant, Mike, who had been on hundreds of flights in small planes before, was screaming uncontrollably, we're going to die, we're going to die. He actually, there was a curse word in there that, I, that was cut, so I tried to tell that to my mother-in-law. Um, I hadn't chosen transplant surgery so I could fly through thunderstorms in the middle of the night over the fields of central Wisconsin. Hell, I'd grown up in New Jersey, spent most of my life in the Northeast, and had never known anything about the Midwest. I had been drawn to Madison because it is one of the best places to be a transplant fellow. And that is how I ended up in Madison. When I went on my first procurement, I was really nervous because I did feel like we were like vultures going to take pieces of someone who had just died. And I pictured that the family who was grieving with this unexpected death would look at us in that way, would think we were the end of their loved one and maybe look at us negatively. And so I was a fellow who was pretty much on that flight. And when we got to this donor hospital up in Green Bay, the team and Mike, who was screaming, said, all right, let's go talk to the donor family. And I was really nervous. We went into the room, and there were like 15 people of different ages crying. And the patient was there, brain dead, but in the room. Looked alive, because brain dead people look alive, actually. They're pink. Their heart is beating. Their organs are working, obviously. And I walked in the room, kind of shaking, nervous. And it was incredible. The family loved talking to us. They hung on to every word. They wanted to know what was going to happen, where were the organs going, would they be transplanted that night, would they work right away, could they find out about the recipients. And then they wanted to tell us about the donor, something the donor loved to do, a sport or a team they liked to watch, what they liked to do with their children. It was this incredible, beautiful moment. And we were kind of all crying. Then they hugged us, and we left with their loved one. When we're in the operating room, we always pause and have a moment of silence when we're doing a donor. And then we talk about the donor, either something they love to do, sometimes a poem or a story that the family has written. Sometimes it's a prayer. And we just remember what it is we're doing and who this donor is. And it's an incredibly special moment. But then we stop, and then we do the operation. And one thing I've always thought about doing surgery, a lot of people probably think it's really stressful to do surgeries. But but the reality is that once you start an operation, it really is like solving a puzzle. You very quickly kind of push out all the emotions, whether it's a deceased donor, whether it's a child you're operating on, whether it's someone who has kids themselves. You're not sitting there thinking, oh my god, somebody loves this person. I better not screw it up. You're actually, those emotions, at least for me, go out of my mind. And you're like, I got to solve this puzzle. Some puzzles are 100 pieces. Some are 1,000. Some seem like they're a million pieces. Some cases are really easy. Some are horrible and just way harder than anticipated. Every case is different. But it's always about solving this puzzle. You've got to focus. You've got to kind of stay internally strong and not get frustrated. And you've got to be really humble. It's really all about getting it right. And if that means calling in uh, someone to help, I do it all the time. Um, there's no room for, you know, well, I can't say there's no room for arrogance, because obviously surgeons are known for arrogance. But the reality is it's, it's really a humbling sport or um, activity. And you can do 10 cases in a row that go perfectly, but then you'll get your butt handed to you on the 11th. And so you have to be really, really careful about knowing when you're getting into trouble, when you need help. 
And um, those are all things I wanted to pass on about this field. I wanted to read this other section because this one's so damn good. Um, this is why I love the field of transplant. Since I began taking care of sick people, I have noticed that one of the hardest things about getting sick, really sick, is that you are separated from the people you love. Even when families are dedicated to the patient, illness separates the well from the sick. The sick suffer alone, they undergo procedures and surgeries alone, and in the end they die alone. Transplant is different. Transplant is all about having someone else join you in your illness. It may be in the form of an organ from a recently deceased donor, a selfless gift given by someone who has never met you, or a kidney or liver from a relative, friend, or acquaintance. In every case, someone is saying, in effect, let me join you in your recovery, your suffering, your fear of the unknown, your desire to become healthy, to get your life back. Let me bear some of your risk with you. I think that, to me, really captures some of my own feelings about illness and about this thing that's special about transplant. Of course, when someone we love is sick, we try to stay with them and be with them and comfort them. But they do get wheeled off to go to these procedures. They're the ones who can't eat because of the procedures. They're the ones who are not feeling well or getting stuck all the time. I mean, they're bearing that themselves, really. And in the end, maybe the saddest part about getting sick and dying, the living will, will move on. I mean, they'll mourn, but they'll move on. And that person will just miss that, will we'll not get to see that someone grow up or their kids get married or whatever it is. And I've always felt this is something so special about transplant where either the dead or a living donor are able to kind of reach out and say, let me, let me bear this with you. Let me, let me do a part of this with you. I, I really, I don't know, it really touches me to think about transplant that way. I feel like this is a good transition to talk a little bit about um, living donors. You know, living donors are a special breed, I think, of heroes, at least in my opinion. They really are the kind of people who run into a burning building to save someone. That's how I see it. The data is actually really great. So if I were to see you in my clinic and talk about, say you want to donate a kidney, which is the most common living donor organ, I can tell you all the data and you'll be like, oh, this is no problem. You have a 3 in 10,000 chance of dying, which is really rare. You have maybe a just less than 1% chance of getting kidney failure in the rest of your life if you donate a kidney, assuming you're healthy, of course, otherwise I wouldn't let you do it. So that's a pretty small number. It's definitely higher than if you don't donate, that's quite clear, but it's still a really small number. The likelihood is extremely high that you'll have the surgery. We'll do it laparoscopically with the cameras. I do some of them even through the belly button where I do the whole surgery through an incision this big and kind of crank, it's crazy, pulling this kidney out and you can't even see the incision. And our patients are going home either the next day or the day after. And yeah, you feel like crap for a week and then you're tired for a month, but life goes on. So when you see that on paper, you think no big deal. But it really is a leap of faith. I don't think the numbers really capture the idea of doing that. It's this incredibly special thing where you find both the time to do it, to fit it into your life, and, and take this step into the unknown. And that's, to me, incredibly special. I, in the book, I talk about Nancy Asher, who's a pretty famous transplant surgeon in San Francisco. She was the chairman of surgery there for many years. She just stepped down from that. But she donated a kidney, and she does kidney donations. And she also describes it, even though she knows the data better than anybody, she still saw it as a leap of faith. She was scared to do it. She didn't really want to do it. Um, but feels like it was incredibly special after she did it. Living donation has really advanced in a lot of ways. But one of, I think, the really exciting advances that I think you guys might appreciate because, I don't know, it seems to fit with tech and math and you know, using computers to help us do it better. Um, this idea of paired exchange. And maybe some of you have heard of that. Actually, it was the first sort of algorithm was written by Alvin Roth, who won a Nobel Prize in game theory some years back and um, has been interested in this field for a long time. But say you want to donate a kidney to a friend, a sibling, uh, a, someone you don't know, whoever it might be. You can donate directly to them, of course. But you have to be blood type compatible. So if you're blood type O, you could donate to anybody. If you're blood type AB, you could only donate to AB. You know, if you're B, you can donate to B. You know, you have to match that up. Now, 
what do you do if you can't match up? Well, you might say, forget it, I can't donate to you. Or you can do a swap. So say you're A and your recipient is B, but then somewhere out there, there's someone who's B who has a donor that's A. What if we organize a swap? So you donate to that person's recipient, and that person's donor donates to your recipient. Simple enough, I would think. Now, it doesn't necessarily only have to have two pairs. There could actually be more pairs involved. The math gets a little more complicated. But there's no reason you couldn't involve three pairs or four pairs. It takes a lot of resources in the operating rooms and surgeons and such. But technically, it's doable. Now, this has been known about for the longest time. 15, 20 years, we've been talking about this concept. But we could never get it to work. And the reason was people felt like the donor and the recipient had to be at the same hospital. So they would actually try and fly the donors to where the recipient was. That ended up being like a total non-starter because I already told you it's this leap of faith and nobody really wants to fly to Cleveland to have surgery, right? That's, you guys don't know Cleveland probably, but <laughs> maybe fly to uh, Dublin? I don't know. <laughs> or how about uh, Edinburgh? You don't want to fly to Edinburgh to donate a kidney, right? You want to be near your family. You want to be able to go home and follow up with those doctors. So paired exchange was always tiny. And it's kind of funny because we've known with deceased donors that we can ship kidneys around and they can be out of the body for 48, even 72 hours and they're still okay. It's a little bit long, but certainly 24 hours is no big deal. But for whatever reason, it took forever. But finally, this organization, the National Kidney Registry, um, which was run by a businessman whose daughter needed a kidney and he couldn't donate to her. And he ended up quitting his job and starting this company using his uh, computer guys and his business acumen, if you will, to kind of get this thing off the ground. And now they're a really huge organization. They're national. And so when we have, you know, every, it's all about having a big N. You need a lot of patience to be able to do this swapping. But, but their computer programs will run these algorithms. And if we have a donor and recipient that don't match, they find someone else in the country and then we take the kidney out at like 6.30 in the morning, send it to Chicago O'Hare, it flies direct to wherever that center is. Meanwhile, they take the kidney out of their donor, it flies in and we transplant it. So by the end of the day, we've transplanted all the kidneys. Well, they've gotten way beyond that where we're doing you know, six-way swaps with multiple different hospitals. But there's this other thing that is so cool. Say you just decide you want to donate a kidney into the pool. You, hear about it, you read my book, you say, this is so heroic, I want to, be a, I want to do this. Um, you could donate to just one person, maybe someone in your community or, I don't know, someone in your, some group you belong to. Or you could donate into the pool. Now, when we get that scenario, especially if the donor happens to be blood type O, I hate to say it because everyone is heroic who donates, but if you're an O, you're particularly heroic. Or mathematically, it's a, it's a better match for everybody. But if you have a scenario like that, you can donate into a chain. Now, for a chain, it's somewhat similar. But you picture there are all these people out there who have donors that can't donate to them. If you start with any blood type that can start it, bless you, or it could be an O, that kidney goes to someone who could be anywhere. And then that starts the chain where then their donor donates to someone, and then their donor donates to someone, and then their donor donates to someone. And this chain can crisscross the country, the US, and the longest one we were a part of had 67 or 68 donor and recipients, and it crisscrossed our country for about three months until finally the chain broke. So that all started with one person donating into the pool. And it didn't happen in one day, you know, it happened over time. There's a lot of logistics. Sometimes we say donation is all about logistics. It's, um, but it's really incredible. And that one person, feels like they just saved all these different lives. And I think this has been this incredible innovation, not based on you know, hard science, but really based on algorithms and math and, um, and the beauty of mankind. It's like really awesome. I mean, it makes me think I want to donate a kidney, but I don't. The biggest thing is like, where do you fit that into your life? I'm sure everyone here feels that way. Like, where do you have you know, a month to say, all right, I'm not going to do stuff you know, for that month? It's extremely challenging. But, but I think so many of our donors will say after they donate, this is the best thing I've ever done. And that's, of course, our goal. I want to read this. I keep reading. My brother makes fun of me because he's like, nobody reads anymore. Um, but I, you know, this is my first book. He's written 21. OK. I talked to you a little bit about the data, the numbers. 
And I've always thought the numbers are really misleading. I think doctors look at numbers different than patients do. I think if I say you have a 3% chance of dying on the table, you would think, ah, oh, that's really great. Whereas I would think that's horrible. There are like almost no surgeries we do that have that kind of mortality rate. When I do liver transplants, it's about a 1% chance of dying on the table. I'm guessing most of you guys think that's incredibly small, but as someone who's done a few hundred liver transplants, it's not a small number. It means I have patients who die on the table. And so I think when we communicate with patients, like we use these numbers, but I've kind of stopped using them because I don't think they're conveying what it is I'm trying to convey. I'll say to a patient, you know, you, you could die during this operation, and they'll say, ah, I could die walking out on the street. I could get in an accident. I'm like, no, 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 this is the accident. You've gotten in the accident. <laughs> so now it's like, you know, there's a, there are different levels of, of risk. Um, but let me read this, because this was really special to me. Here's an example of why the numbers don't always affect a donor's decision. A potential donor came to see me wanting to donate a kidney to his wife, the love of his life, the mother of his children. He had been turned down by a major program due to medical reasons. He didn't have any absolute contraindications. He was not diabetic, didn't have heart disease, didn't have any cancers. But he was obese, his blood pressure was high, and he had a history of smoking. Each one of those things could have increased his risk of having a problem with his remaining kidney someday. When I first saw this man, I had my doubts too. But he told me, I know you guys think I'm a little more high risk than your average donor. I get that, but you've got to help me. This is something I really want to do. My wife is my whole life. Our family doesn't work without her. She has done so much for me. If you let me do this, I will thank you forever. I'll sign any form you want. I promise I won't sue you. That's what the doc always wants to hear. <laughs> you guys probably don't have that as much here, but... Um, if down the road something happens to my other kidney and I go on dialysis, it will be worth it for me. I have no hesitation. What do you say to that? This man seemed to have grasped the data, understood the risks I'd outlined for him. Wasn't it his body? How paternalistic was I supposed to be? Of course it was possible for someone to make a bad, even an unreasonable decision for himself to protect someone he loved. Was there a risk that was so high that we would have to say no? We wouldn't let mothers and fathers donate their hearts to their children, even though many patients would be willing to do this. In the end, I let the guy donate, but not before giving him my standard line. It's not necessarily database, but I believe it. If you donate and stop smoking, you may actually be healthier than if you don't donate and keep smoking. Of course, the worst scenario was the most likely one, that he'd donate and keep smoking. Let me skip down. Back in my clinic about a month after the surgery, I asked him how he felt about the whole process. Doc, this is the best thing I have, I've ever done in my life. Sure, I had a bad few days, but I have my wife back. I will never be able to thank you enough for what you did for my family. He gave me a big, warm handshake. His thick, ruddy hand enveloped mine. It was the hand of someone who had done physical labor all his life, a hand that would provide for his family no matter how much it took from him. He got one thing wrong. I'm not the one who did something for his family. I know, that story really touches me because I realize, like, when it comes to risk, I mean, whose choice is it? I mean, we obviously play this role, but, but can't people make their own decisions about that? I think it's quite interesting. That story, actually, I love, I love the part about the ruddy hand, the hand that worked all his life. So it turns out I have really soft hands that are not ruddy whatsoever. But um, my daughters are really into horseback riding, so we took them to a dude ranch out in Wyoming last year, which was pretty fun, but I definitely, my body was not built for that kind of living. And um, it was pretty embarrassing, like my back is terrible and I, I could barely like lift the saddle and they gave me like a high up saddle and they wanted us to put them away, but I, I couldn't do it. So I paid off one of the Wranglers to move the saddle for me. But when I was shaking his hand, his hand was like a Brillo pad, like I could not believe how harsh it was. And he was like, your hands, they're so soft. And like everyone came running over and men and women, all the Wranglers were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So it's a little bit embarrassing. I don't have the ruddy hand, um, the ruddy hand of someone who's worked their whole life. But, you know, I, I, do, I do think, it, I mentioned that ethical issue that we deal with about who gets to decide these kinds of things. I mean, transplant is just filled with ethical issues that are so fascinating that we literally deal with every day. Um, who should get the limited resource of transplant? Who should be allowed to donate with living donors? You know, when it comes to livers, should we be transplanting livers into alcoholism? You know, 
should, should we be transplanting organs into people that cause their own disease? I mean, all of these things could be their own lecture. The truth is, like, pretty much most diseases other than pediatric stuff have some role of environment which may involve something you may or may not have been involved with, some role of genetics and some role of good or bad luck. And I do think if you start to judge people and say, well, you caused this, you're probably in the wrong field. I mean, medicine is filled with that, and I don't think that's our role. But the reality is at the same time, we have to make decisions about limited resources. Should prisoners you know, get organs? All of these things, which each one could be its own lecture. I do like to point out transplant sits on this line of life and death. And transplant actually played this central role in defining death, or at least defining brain death. Before the 1960s, there wasn't really this codified definition of brain death. There was the French had um, this idea of coma de passe, which was written about in the 40s and 50s, which was essentially brain death. But I would say it wasn't really accepted uh, around the country. In the early 60s, some transplant surgeons started taking organs out of patients who had beating hearts. Before that, the heart would have to stop beating. Essentially, it was a corpse, and the organs would then be taken. But people knew that wasn't great for the organs. But in the mid-60s, some people started taking kidneys out while the heart was still beating. It was actually a Belgian surgeon who was the first one to report this. And that was pretty startling to a lot of transplant surgeons who thought, you know, maybe that was murder, really. I mean, these patients weren't going to recover. They had horrible injuries that would have fit the definition of brain death. But that term was certainly not a legal definition. It really was when heart transplant became a reality, a bad reality, in 1967, 68, that the public got horrified or fearful of this idea of hearts being taken out of people while they were still beating, because that really was rather dramatic and people got afraid that transplant surgeons were killing people. And so in 1968, a commission got together at Harvard that included Joe Murray, who was a very prominent transplant surgeon, probably the most famous transplant surgeon. He won the Nobel Prize in 1990, as, long, as well as some ethicists. And they actually wrote the article in JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, that defined brain death. And Joe Murray wanted to write brain death wanted to write death. He didn't want to include the term brain death. But the committee said, no, 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 it's brain death. It's something different. In the, in the US, there were a lot of struggles getting people to accept this idea that brain death w was a meaningful definition. Because before that, death was when the heart stopped. And I think when you ask people in the public, that might be still what a lot of people think. So over this decade, from 68 until about 1980, there was a lot of controversy a lot of transplant surgeons that paid some heavy prices trying to push this idea. Not just transplant, it also had to do with futility in the ICU when to withdraw people from life support. And it was in around 1980 that in the US, brain death became legally dead. I, th I believe Britain, it was 1976. Actually, you guys did a better job because our law says if a person, either their heart stops irreversibly or the entire brain is dead, including the brain stem and the entire brain, then that's consistent with death, legally, with the legal death. Whereas there are a lot of problems with that law. Number one, what is irreversible? Because we know we could take the heart out and restart it, right? So like that's, ethicists love to argue on that semantical point. But the other piece is like, how do we know the whole brain is dead? That's actually not something we really test for. We do these tests like an apnea test, where we make sure the person can't breathe without the ventilator. And then we do imaging to show there's not blood flow to the brain. <laughs> Although you don't legally have to do the imaging, but we all do. But you don't actually know if every piece of the brain is dead. In the British law, they wrote that if the brain stem is dead, that's consistent with um, not being alive and support can be withdrawn. That's paraphrased a bit, so if any of you guys are legally inclined, don't nail me on that. But I think it was smart to be more specific about the brain stem, because that is what we actually test for. And it does mean you would never be able to be liberated from a vent. This has become a real controversy, because there have been a number of patients, at least in the, in the US, where for different reasons, families have fought uh, trying to withdraw support from brain dead patients. And there was a very famous case of late that's filtering through the court systems, this young African-American girl 
who had a tonsillectomy and horrible complication became brain dead. But suffice it to say, um, there are a lot of legal battles ongoing. And I do worry that brain death could get challenged as high as our Supreme Court. And as our Supreme Court starts shifting a, quite a bit in, in the direction it leans in our country, it's not impossible that brain death could actually get overturned. I don't think that'll happen. I think it's the kind of case they wouldn't take on because it's been adjudicated. But it's really hard to know. Brain death, in my opinion, has been this incredible gift to healthcare because I don't know if brain death is death. It's certainly not alive. Like, that's quite clear. And no one could possibly, I can't really say this, but to me it seems like no one could want to live, could want to be like that. There's like no value to that. It can never recover. It's absolutely horrible. And one thing we do wrong in our healthcare system is when we have patients that are in the ICU, we go to the family and we make them decide everything. Like, do you want to withdraw support on your mom, on your brother, on so-and-so? Do you want to stop care? At least with brain death, we're able to say to families, your loved one is brain dead. There's no decision to make here. It's, you know, it's time to stop. And I think that's been a huge gift to healthcare. It's been a huge gift to transplant as well. But I, I see brain death as all positive, but I get the semantical arguments. It was a made up definition. I mean, the truth of the matter is laws are drawing lines, right? We draw lines, that's how laws work. We decide that, you know, it's okay to do certain things, that, but this is where we draw the line. In the American, I just, think about this case in the US, it's okay for people to give tons of money to a university they went to to get their kid in, but it's not okay for them to pay off and actually get their kid in through a side door. You could make arguments, but that's where the line has been drawn. I think brain death is a really clear and really good line. Um, all of these topics we could have you know, a long debate about, and that's, I think, why I love the field of transplant. I want to end, though, with a few more of my beautiful words. That joke never gets old to me. Um, As the plane levels out at 20,000 feet, I look over at Felix, our German-trained procurement surgeon, stretched out comfortably in his seat, headphones on, fast asleep. Wide awake myself, I look out at the night sky, now lit up by the moon. For a second, I wonder what I'm doing here, flying in this little plane over the farmlands of Oshkosh, separated from my family. My two little girls, now sleeping peacefully at home, will wake up in the morning and discover me gone, an experience they're quite familiar with. I shift my gaze back to Felix along his extended legs and down to the cooler he is so unceremoniously using as a footrest. Inside sit a liver, two kidneys, and a pancreas. Somewhere else in this same night sky, under this same moon, two other planes are flying in different directions from ours. Each one has a cooler. One contains a heart, the other two lungs. Just two days ago, these organs were working in concert, allowing a 42-year-old father to eat, drink, go to work, hold his kids. These organs helped him climb up on his roof to clean out the gutters, but they couldn't stop him from falling off. Now they sit in ice until they will be filled with blood and return to the living, ready to sustain a new body, allowing five other people to live, love, be happy, be sad, enjoy their families. These five people don't know one another, don't even live in the same city but they will forever be joined by the web of transplantation. They will be saved by some guy who will never get to see his gift of life, but maybe down the road his wife and children will, and maybe they'll think, yes, he was some guy. I know that's what I think. I lean back and close my eyes, but I can't sleep. That's how it ends. Thank you so much. Thank we you. have um, some time for questions now, and because I'm selfish, I'll start with one for yes. me. What do you think will be the next big, controversial, ethically challenging development in transplant surgery? Well, I, you know, transplant is all about innovation, and I do think we're on the verge of another, you know, huge kind of quantum jump. So the area that to me is most exciting but will be ethically challenging, I imagine, is xenotransplantation. So this idea of transplanting organs from animals into humans. That idea has been around for a long time, and actually in the 60s, um, there, was a, there were quite a few organs from primates transplanted into humans. The guy who did the most was this guy, Keith Reemsma, who was down in New Orleans, and now is, or he's dead now, but he, then he went up to New York. But he transplanted something like eight or nine chimpanzee kidneys into humans, and he would transplant both kidneys because chimps are, are pretty small. But they share a ton of genes with humans, like 96, 97% of genes. And back then, we didn't really have great immunosuppression. 
But one of his recipients, actually, the organ lasted like eight months, and then the patient died with a functioning organ. Actually, she was peeing so much that her electrolytes got screwed up, and she died from that. No one is thinking about transplanting organs from primates anymore for lots of different reasons. Well, if, or, like animals like chimps are protected. Um, but beyond that, I think the idea of breeding primates to transplant into humans is not something humans would accept. It's also not practical because primates kind of breed like humans. They don't have big litters. There's a lot of concern about xenoviruses that could come from a primate. The expenses are huge. Um, you'd actually have to use apes to have organs that are big enough. And it's just not, no one would allow this to happen. But now the big interest is in pigs. So pigs, well, nobody seems to mind. We already kill millions and millions of pigs for food. And we already use a lot of pig tissue in humans, heart valves, dermis, uh, for, for hernia repairs, these kinds of things. So at least those barriers have been breached already. Pigs breed really easily. They have bigger litters. They breed pretty quickly and pretty young. The challenge is that these lower level animals below primate have this protein on all of their cells called alpha-gal, which is like a sugar moiety, and humans have natural antibodies to them. Those have been knocked out for ver through various techniques. And with CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, there have been a lot of advances in the last few years at manipulating some genes, not to make the pig organs look like humans, but to just knock off certain barriers. And we already have, in primates that are serving as the model for human, we have pig kidneys transplanted into primates that are lasting as long as two years, using pretty strong immunosuppression. Most people think in the next five years there are going to be some human trials transplanting pig organs into humans, highly selected humans. It won't be an overnight home run. It's just never going to be like that. But I do think it's realistic to think that this could be a reality to kind of address the organ shortage, maybe in our lifetimes, hopefully. I think the, there'll be controversy using, you know, breeding animals for organ transplant is inherently controversial. And then, of course, concerns about xenoviruses, which I think are less of an issue because there are a lot of strategies to prevent that. But at the same time, I think the barrier of breeding pigs for this purpose is not as high as, as what it would be for primates. So like that, to me, is maybe the, the most obvious answer. But there's tons of other innovation that are going on that would, would really bl blow everyone's mind, I think, from, from putting organs on pumps and actually repairing them outside the body. Um, various genetic manipulations to do stem cell therapies, um, these types of things. Um, I think that, that, that's what comes to mind. Any questions there? Uh, thanks very much for coming in today. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, over your experiences, um, what factors beyond just the blood matching type have you seen deliver higher success rates? Um, specifically for kidney, and is there an optimal age as well for um, having a higher success rate for a, a, a kidney transplant? Yeah, and those are good questions. So we've made you know, really great advances in understanding kind of matching. So the, the biggest barrier is blood type compatibility, and it's challenging to go across an incompatibility. It can be done, but like in this day and age, there are probably other strategies like paired exchange that would be a better option for that. But that's not all that goes into matching. There are a lot of proteins that we all express that are quite diverse, and humans can develop antibodies and have T cell responses to those proteins. Now, we over immunosuppress everyone, so the, cha the likelihood is, unless you have a previous transplant or a lot of blood transfusions and have tons of antibodies, we can probably get good results even across some pretty good disparity. But we've gotten better and better at molecularly typing people and being able to tell what the match is going to be and being able to look inside your blood and see what antibodies you might already have. So in the old days, we, actually, you know, we would just mix blood together. So you would mix serum of a recipient against uh, cells of the donor and then see if they lysed the cells. And that was what a cross match was. And if they lysed the cells, we're like, oh, we can't do this transplant. We don't, and in fact, if you wanted to know if someone had a lot of antibodies in their blood, you would collect random samples from 100 people that lived in their area, because presumably their organ would come in that area, and then you would mix their serum with all of those, and the percent that they responded to 
was considered their, their PRA or their panel of reactive antibodies. So if you had tons of antibodies, you would be you'd respond to all 100 samples, you'd be 100% PRA. That's really primitive now. Now we have beads that each bead expresses a different protein that is part of this response. And we molecularly type um, the donor and then we make beads, we select beads with all of those proteins and then we can mix the serum against those beads and really define exactly what antibody someone's going to have and know exactly the mismatch. Now the challenge is that when it comes to actually sharing organs, it's probably too much work to really try and match people up well because the benefits are probably outweighed by the strong immunosuppression that we're using. But I do think when it comes to paired exchange where you have living donors and you have a little more time, you're not in this stress of time where you've got to do the transplant within a day or two, we actually can look for better and better matches. And we know that better matching can improve outcomes. So that's actually quite fascinating. There are even some protocols to try and withdraw immunosuppression in very select cases. That's called transplant tolerance. I don't think that's ever going to be available for everyone, but in select cases it might be. Now, ideal age of the donor. So, you know, age is a decent surrogate marker for health. It's not a perfect surrogate marker. So, in general, younger organs may be suspected to be better than older organs. It's not the only factor that matters. With deceased donors, we have a scoring system where we actually throw in all the data. How old was the donor? Did they smoke? What was their kidney clearance? You know, did they have high blood pressure? Did they have all these things? And you actually come up with a number. And age is one of those factors, but it's not the only one. We don't typically do that with living donors, but we certainly look at their age and their clearance. And I think in general, it's fair to say that yes, a 20-year-old kidney is probably going to be better than the average 70-year-old kidney. That said, we do living donors who are in their 70s or even 80s. We'll usually do them maybe to a spouse where the metabolic needs of the recipient are not quite as high. Or that might be a good scenario to do a paired exchange. Like say a, a grandfather wants to donate to their grandchild and they could match. But you say, you know what, rather than giving directly to this young person, let's put you into the paired exchange and maybe you can give your kidney to someone that can't match and then their donor can give it to your grandchild and everyone wins. So we do use these strategies um, to kind of maximize everyone's outcomes. It's quite, quite fascinating, actually. But age is one marker. It's not the only marker. We have time for one more question, and I have a volunteer. Thank you. Um, to what extent would you say the organ shortage is because of opt-in rates, and how does that differ across the US and the UK? Yeah, I was wondering if someone would ask that because I believe you guys are going to a, an opt-out system in 2020. That's what I've heard. So it's, it's really interesting. I, we think about this a lot and I don't know enough about UK to know for sure what's best for you guys. I think in the American system, I think opt-out presents some, some problems actually. There are a couple of thoughts. Number one, I, re I really do see this organ donation as this incredible gift, and I want the donors to feel like it's this wonderful gift, this wonderful legacy. It's really critical that there is consensus that people want to donate. Now, the best thing is to have first-person consent, where the person had thought about it and they signed up either online or when they got their driver's license. But it's really important that, that there's consensus in that they look at it as this gift. I look at the families of the donors as kind of like my patients too. Like if they, they're the living, they're the ones who have to bear this memory. So they need to be all in. There are scenarios where it's tough where someone wanted to donate and the family didn't want to, but that's pretty rare. But the other piece is we have some distrust of our healthcare system in the US. We have disparities in healthcare across socioeconomic areas and so I do worry in the US that with an opt-out system, you could have some scenarios where people feel like their loved one had their organs taken or they didn't get ideal care because of that, because of the organ donation. And, and that's where I kind of worry about an opt-out system. I mean, we can't even get people to vaccinate in our country right now. So like, I do worry about that. I personally think that great, we need to do a better job of education, of telling stories like this, of celebrating the donors, of using social media, of getting, you know, LeBron James to talk about organ donation, of like really pushing this message about how beautiful it is. And why are we not going to kids in school and talking to them about this? There's always this fear like, 
you can't talk about death with young people. I mean, I think young, not little kids, but like, you know, kids in high school should, we should be talking about it. We should, we should be getting advanced directives from everyone. We should be talking about organ donation. So that's to me where I think in the US it would work best. There are a number of countries that do opt out. I believe Spain has done that for quite a while. And, um, you know, there's some modeling to suggest it will increase donation rates. And it's, I'm going to be really fascinated to see how it works in UK, whether everyone is into it, whether there's any controversy. Maybe it'll be a tool to educate. Maybe that'll help educate. But to me, better education and really celebrating it is the way to go in the US. I do want to increase organ donation. I'm a huge believer in it. But I do see that the only role, the role is not only to get more organs for recipients. It's to get people to buy into this, this incredible thing that they can be a part of. And so to me, that's really important. But I will watch with interest on how it plays out here. I think Ireland is doing it as well, I believe. So, yeah.